falls over the crowd. That looks great, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug Ulwick. I'm the president of the Historical Society of Old Abington, and I welcome you to our first conversation of the 2018-2019 season. I think we pulled together a very interesting series of programs for you this year, and we're looking forward to great participation. I'll talk a little bit more about that later before we head off to refreshments. But we always start all of our meetings with the same way, and that's with a salute to the flag. So with those who choose to stand and salute, I worded that carefully, please do so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And the key word you just said was liberty, and we have someone who wants to make some announcements to us today about the goings on at Dyer Library, and it's Merlin Liberty. Hi, everyone. Was that, how was that for a segue? That was a beautiful Wasn't segue. Wasn't it, though? <laughs> yes, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Merlin Liberty, and I'm the librarian archivist here at the Dyer Memorial Library. We are always pleased that HSOA gets to host its meetings here. Thank you, Marietta Dyer, for saying, should a historical society ever be formed? They can do everything they need to it here at the Dyer. And here we are. And here we are. So um, I'm here to uh, say thank you for coming, and also to say that um, the Dyer and HSOA, um, we have a lot of materials here that are commingled, and we need help in taking care of them. And so um, we need volunteers to help us do a lot of different things. Um, and of course, it's a time commitment, but you get to come in here, which is a pretty cool place. And you could do interesting, fun things, or you can do tedious, dull things that for some people uh, find to be very, you know, comforting and calming. Think, think of this meditation. Removing sta <laughs> staples could be very meditative. Um, but that's something we, we really need help doing uh, a lot of processing for our collections. And, um, you know, the thing is, is that the Dyer, throughout the years, we've always uh, relied on our volunteer pool. And right now we're at basically a record low of volunteers. And, um, so any help you can provide to us would be terrific. And I know that this also goes for some, you know, the HSOA meetings and that sort of thing. I think Doug has some sign-up sheets for, for various activities back there. Um, but for example, some of the things that, that you could be doing here would be um, helping us to, to process documents, artifacts, materials. There's a big word saying that people bring us some of these great things from their homes that have to do with the three towns and we need to sort through them and determine what what needs to be go into our collection and and your memories about the towns help us determine the value of of these artifacts and documents and things that we're looking at you know so this so it's not just an arbitrary oh you know this ticket from a movie theater we don't need that because it's been torn somebody will look at this ticket that's been torn and say, oh, I remember going to that movie theater as a kid. It doesn't exist anymore, but this is what was there and that's why it's important. So it's really your memories of the area help us catalog and preserve the materials here better. So this is where you know, it's like your brain trust is really magnificent and we really need to harness that uh, going forward. Um, so the other thing that is involved with that has to do with typing or just transcribing information from the documents or describing what it is that we have. Like for instance, uh, the two flags on the sign-up forms back there, they're on these pedestals that say WRC. And what those pedestals came from was from the Women's Relief Corps, which was an offshoot from the GAR. So these have a history in themselves, and you know, just describing, oh, this is, this is a flag stand that came from this organization and it happened to be in Abington. Um, so describing these things, writing things down, um, indexing, uh, you know, we have a lot of um, 
We have some World War II veterans cards that need to be indexed. If you're great with Excel or any word processing, you know, that's really wonderful and helpful to us. Um, the other projects that we have going on are transcribing documents, which means, you know, uh, we have some, like for now, one of the biggest projects that we have going is the Cyrus Nash papers. They've already been written down, but now we need people to type them so that we can put them online and people can search through them, you know, word search, so that people can find out a lot about this area. Because he is just a rich resource. Um, some of, if you, if you know anything about, or we can actually, we will be teaching you, uh, you know, to scan some documents. Um, one of the things that we have is we have Martha Campbell's uh, pedigree charts for a whole bunch of families from all three towns. And we need to scan those so that if somebody's doing their genealogy research and they live in California, we can say, here's a pedigree chart. It's already been scanned, and we can send it to them. Rather than photocopying it, it cuts off the edge. And she wrote in mouse print. You can't. <laughs> it's a stop. You have to use a magnifying glass to read it. So, but we would teach you how to do these things. And um, then, of course, the last and the last item that actually works with, with today's uh, event is just helping to host any sort of special events that come along. I know that HSOA really needs the help in, in ensuring these are as wonderful um, as they can be, and you know the contributions that everybody makes uh, with with the food and you know setting up and all that. That's really important, and it makes these go really smoothly. And for the dyer activities, we need similar help, and so there's a lot of crossover here. Um, we don't do anything independently here at the dyer. But <laughs> HSOA and the dyer are. are Almost one of the same, except we have different initials. We're linked at the hip. <laughs> we are linked at the hip. We work hand in glove. So, anyhow, if if you are, uh, if you have some time, you have an hour, you know, once a week, once a month, something like that. I know we'd all be grateful for your help. So, I just wanted to put that out there, think it over, and um, I know Doug has. There are some HSOA sign-up sheets back uh -huh. there uh, for for some events, but. For some um, activities, uh, and just you know, let us know. <coughs> Thank you very much, and enjoy the program this afternoon. It's really interesting. Thank you, Merlin. Thank you. Jeff, pull the plug. <laughs> <laughs> when all else fails, Jeff, pull the plug. The radio's still on. So. <laughs> anyway, in speaking of the spirit of volunteerism, um, I. I would be remiss if I didn't note the passing this summer of Mary Rourke. Uh, Mary was a past president of the Historical Society, as I recall. She certainly was a dire trustee, uh, always willing to pitch in and help any way she can and could. And uh, her passing leaves kind of a big void in a lot of places. So uh, I, I uh, want to uh, make note of her passing and say we all miss her already. And. Uh, need people to step forward and do the sort of things that Mary Rourke did. For her, it was she felt it was a calling, she felt it was an important thing to do, and she did it. So uh, we, we look for people to, well, we can't fill those shoes, but we look for people to, to volunteer in that spirit, to help us and to help the dyer. So that's, that's something we look forward to. Uh, anyway, I'm going to talk later, our, the way we're setting up the conversation today, we used to do programs, now we do conversations. Um, I'm going to invite our, our guest today up and we're going to talk a little bit about his subject and how it came about. And then he is going to do uh, a visual display and talk about that. Then I'm going to come back up and summarize and we're going to have questions. And then I'm going to release you to... Go have food. <laughs> That's what you're really here for, I know. <laughs> Got good stuff out there today. Um, anyway, so without further ado, uh, today's topic is Thomas Drew's South Shore. It's based on this book, which will be available to you. I got my advanced copy. And uh, our, our guest today is the author of that, Les Molyneux. Les, if you come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat.
and we'll start the Inquisition. <laughs> I've enjoyed the book, first of all. It's great. Uh, everyone loves looking at old photographs, particularly if you know where they are today. And there have been other authors who have done a then and now sort of thing. But it really always highlights the first question is, how did you get started on this? What was the source to come up with all the photographs and the background information that, that you used to create the book? Well, I've been a collector for many years. Of everything, right? Of everything, <laughs> but in particular photography. I love photography, and I would go to auctions, and actually I had my own antique shop for over 20 years, and I gathered many, many photographs. And among them were about 100 glass plate negatives mm -hmm. that were taken by Thomas Drew around 1900. Now, glass plate negatives is the old, old kind of photographs. It's a sheet of glass on which uh, emulsion was placed. And the photographer had to carry these. If he was going to take 60 pictures, he'd have to take 60 of these around. And uh, so glass plate negatives take up a lot of space. Mm. And I had 100 of these from Thomas Drew that occupied a certain corner of my house for since 1982. The Drew Corner. <laughs> and uh, I finally decided it was time to do something with them. And about that time, a relative of the Drew family donated another 100 glass plate negatives to the Hanover Historical Society, of which I'm the co-president. So now I had, a, I had 200 of them. And uh, the family also donated one of Thomas Drew, actually two of Thomas Drew's cameras. So we had a, a really nice collection. So I donated my glass negatives to the Historical Society, got them out of the house, there you go. and uh, combined it with the other donation. And I scanned all of them on my scanner and put them together to create this book. Wonderful, absolutely. Um, and, and the scanning process, I mean, it, that's a special scanner. It's not just one that you go to Office Max or something and pick one up because yeah. it's a transparency scanner. Is that correct? That's right. Talk so, to our tech heads for a minute here. But I mean, it's. So a transparency scanner has a light in the top of it and uh, it shines through mm -hmm. so that the scanner can, can, pick can up the get image. the image. Right. And then it automatically uh, converts the negative into a positive. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding also of how the photographers did things back then, you talked about needing to carry the plates. They were wet plates, as I recall. No, no these were dry, dry plates. Okay. Yeah. Dry plates, I think, were actually made here in Abington. by Oh, really? Do, yeah. Um, but it, it, certainly at some point during, during that photography period, photographers actually had carts that they ro rolled around with them or, or carted around with them, and, and the initial processing happened in the carts. Was that only for wet plate? Yes. Okay, so by uh, the time we got to dry port... Mr. Drew okay. did his processing in his kitchen. <laughs> um, he, and he what would... did his wife have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was in a number of the pictures, yeah, okay. so I imagine that <laughs> kept her happy. <laughs> Very good, okay. Um, and he had a fairly limited area he photographed, and he was based in Hanover, near, was it near Five Corners? or No, it wasn't. South Hanover. South Hanover. South Hanover, on Broadway. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, he was a storekeeper, and uh, he lived almost across from his store, the Thomas Drew store. If you're familiar with South Hanover, uh, the store is still there. It's called Mayette's. <laughs> and uh, they yeah. advertise that they're one of the oldest continuously operating general stores in America. And Tom Drew started it. So cool. That's excellent. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump out now because he's got like 60 images that he's going to share. And so we're going to kind of go through them a little quickly because we spent a minute apiece. We're here for an hour. So we're not doing that. But anyway, um, he has a prepared sequence of images. Uh, after we see them, we may all have some more questions. I suspect I will. So uh, when he's done the presentation, I will jump back up. And, um, and and we'll have a, we'll continue the conversation afterwards. So I'm going to turn on the projector, and if you would shut off the lights, 
You have all these assistants here. I love it. <coughs> and then the secret switch no one knows about is there. Okay. <laughs> Except now it's on cable and everyone does. You want any music? <laughs> hmm? You want any music? Music? No, I think we're good. <laughs> now that you're an expert with the uh, with the equipment there. <laughs> And before I start, I'll point out that uh, the Dyer Library has two albums over here that you can look at afterwards of Thomas Drew photos. And there's probably 50 or 60 different images. And many of those are actually in my book. I, I did credit the Dyer Library for identifying some of the people who were in some of the photos. Thomas Drew was, was very good was very good in identifying most of his pictures, but there were a number of them that I had no idea who the people were who were in the photos, and your albums helped me with, with some of them. So that's the cover of my book. This is the front of his store at South Hanover. Uh, my book basically, he, he took pictures of things that interested him. And that included his family, his neighbors, um, things that were, were of interest to him. You have to keep in mind that he had to ride around on a horse. And he had to carry glass plate negatives. And that's his small camera. That weighs six pounds. The big camera weighs 11 pounds. So he wasn't traveling too, too far. Uh, but he did, he did get into surrounding towns. Uh, he spent a, a good deal of time in Halifax because that's where his grandfather lived. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a, a few slides from each one of the chapters in the book just so that you'll get some idea of what it's about. Thomas Drew, circa, 19, or circa 1890. He was actually born in 1845 in Falmouth. Uh, he grew up in Hanson, uh, lived at 55 Spring Street in Hanson. That was his family home. Uh, some of you may know, may have known Rodney Brunzel, who was a, a collector of postcards here in the South Shore. That was his house. It's almost opposite the Hitching Post in Hanson. Uh, his grandparents lived on River Street in Halifax. And uh, I spent a good deal of time down there in South Halifax trying to retrace his steps and trying to find out what some of the photos were that I knew were from that neighborhood. Um, his father operated a general store at Harding's Corner in Hanson. Um, for those of you who've been around for a few years, um, Paul Diaz had an auction gallery at, at that intersection. Um, and the general store he kept for a while, and then he moved it to his house. Thomas and Cyrus, uh, father and son, were both Civil War veterans. Uh, they didn't serve for very long, didn't see any uh, battle action, but they were Civil War veterans. And Tom took over his father, Cyrus's business, and eventually moved from Hanson to South Hanover, where he was the postmaster. Uh, as well as uh, other things. And he died in 1913 in Hanover. So his photo, the photography is 1890, 1910 primarily. Uh, Thompson Street in Halifax is Route 106. The Thompson Cemetery uh, holds a number of the Drew ancestors. The Drew family goes way, way back in time in Plymouth County. In fact, his fourth great grandparent was related to Priscilla Alden's daughter. Uh, so, you know, they were they've been in the in the area for many, many years. In fact, in the Thompson Cemetery, there's a headstone for Mr. Thomas Drew, not my Tom Drew, but one of his ancestors. And Thomas Drew took a picture of this in 1900, which is in my book. I took this in last year, and that stone looks the same today as it did in 1900. Amazing, because it's got these iron repairs on them. But those slate stones last a long time. That's the 1700 stone. 
As I said, Tom Drew was a, was a veteran, Civil War veteran. Uh, he was a storekeeper, uh, but he kept all of his Civil War garb, and here he is in his old age. He's still fit in his uniform and uh, posing for his own camera. The Tom Drew store, South Hanover, as I said, that's uh, where Mayette's store is today. Back then, there weren't refrigerators, lots of canned goods, lots of packaged goods. That may be his daughter Jane there, I really don't know. But there's interesting advertising. And the nice thing about glass plate negatives is they have very high resolution. Mm -hmm. You can blow those pictures up to a very large size and still be able to read it. Uh, I was able to read the reunion uh, poster up there, and it's June of 1907. Tom Drew, as I said, was a businessman. This is his business card, appropriate that the, the generic image could be a North River image with the hay staddles. Dealer in dry and fancy goods, clothes, boots, shoes, carpeting, hardware, woodenware, stoneware, crockery, farming tools, seeds, flour, grain, groceries, he sold everything. And that's what the, that's what the store looks like today. Uh, hasn't changed much at all, except there was a piece that was on here that got moved around the corner. That's one of the cameras that he used. Um, they're called, a, it's called a Henry Clay model and it folds up into a, into a box so that when you're carrying it, you're not going to damage your, your lenses or anything. And it's in remarkably good shape. A lot of times the old weather bellows get dried out and rot and, and break up, but it's still in good shape. And that's the other camera. Tom Drew was, was pretty good at public relations for, you know, 1900. He advertised himself well. He, he made cameras to give out to his, to his customers, so you hung that on the wall and it's going to remind you that's Tom himself reclining uh, under a tree. And this picture here is a picture of all of his Civil War, you know, equipment. The canteen, the, the sword, stirrups, the gun, the whole bit. Pretty creative. He's even got ivy growing up the wall there. I think that was a really, really neat picture. Um, he sent images off to Germany and had China made. Uh, and he sold the China in his store. This is the Phillips Tack Works in South Hanover, which was almost across the street from his store. Um, but he also this actually says the Old Fellows Hall, Hanover Mass. That was up the four corners, except it wasn't the Old Fellows Hall, it was the Odd Fellows Hall. Uh, and behind it was the, the old, uh, an old school, which has long since been torn down. He also did postcards. Um, a number of them are photo postcards, and if any of you collect postcards, you probably have seen some of his cards. Others were sent to Germany, and some of them come back hand-painted, hand-watercolored, and others were left black and white. And this one, this is a picture of Project Dale. This is Water Street, Hanover. The house is still there. The Waterman Tack factory across to the right is still there. Project Dale the dam went out in 1938, and it's no longer there, but the rail bed is still there too. So it doesn't look too different today. But the cool thing here is, this is Tom's writing. This is one of the postals out of my store. I like my work very much and think I shall like it better and go on. Wish you could come in and see me some evening. I have to keep the store until eight. So he kept pretty long hours uh, for those days. Um, this is an 1879 map of, of uh, Halifax. The, his grandfather's house was right there. This is River Street. This is Thompson Street, 106. And South Street is the north-south one over there. 
back then there were there was a dam and there were mills, all sorts of things going on that would interest a young person. This is the 1903 map of, uh, of South Halifax, and you can see the Thompson and Haywood sawmill. I thought I had my pointer here, but I don't see it. Um, in any event, this is what it would have looked like when, when Thomas Drew was, was down there visiting. So there were mills, and there were various houses along here, and he did take pictures of many of these houses. This is Middleborough down here. This was the George Drew House on River Street in Halifax. It was a early colonial house, early, uh, what do I want to say? What style of house is that? It's not a cape, colonial, I guess. Uh, the unusual thing is that it faced the, the back of the house faced the street. This is a postcard that I got from the um, Halifax Historical Society. Um, thank you. I never would have seen it. Uh, the Woods Bridges over the Winnetuxet River in Halifax. And the other side of it, you can see it says photo by Thomas Drew, South Hanover, printed in Germany. And the message is, Dear Grandpa, pickle the quart of huckleberries from Arlene. And that's dated 1909. And this was one of the, the mills that was in existence when Tom Drew was around taking pictures nine, around 1900. This is what the Winnetuxet River looks like today. It's a lovely area down there. Um, a lot of land has been preserved uh, in sanctuaries. It's a winding, winding river. Corner of River Street and Wood Street, Halifax, the Cobb Leach House really old elm trees. This is Halifax Center. Uh, that's the original town hall that burned down, I think, in 1907 and was replaced. This is the Congregational Church. Now we move to Hanson. This is Harding's Corner, Washington Street. This is West Washington, East Washington, Spring Street. And there's the Cyrus Drew House. The store that he used to have was located here. This was after he moved to his house. And his daughter actually ran a public library out of one of the buildings on their property. That's the Cyrus Drew house. I think he posed the whole family there. There's somebody standing over there. There's somebody there. I think there's somebody in the window. And there's somebody over here. There's somebody here. Uh, so I think he's got, got his mother and father and sisters and everybody in that. And that house is still there. This is what the store looked like. Uh, that is a really neat picture. It shows you what Cyrus sold. He's got chairs and he's got clothing and uh, he's got baby carriages and all sorts of stuff. Dry goods and furniture. This is Harding's Corner. This is a photo postcard that, that Drew took. Uh, that is the store. This is after his father moved out of it and somebody else operated. This was the waiting, the waiting room for the trolley. Uh, and you can see kids waiting to go to school and another girl waiting here. Off to the right here, there's a house and you can see two chairs there. Uh, I had to do a lot of detective work uh, on, on many of these. This picture here, I had no idea what it was. It says, Town Clerk's Office. And I went around to all the town clerks and said, when was your town clerk's office not in town hall? And nobody knew the answer. And I went to the Hanson Historical Society, and Alan Phillips said, that's John Skates. And sure enough, John Skates was the town clerk in 1900. Wow. John Skates was, a, was the oldest living Civil War veteran in the town of Hanson. He moved to Hanson in the 1880s. He married late. I'm sure one of these ladies is his wife. 
And that was his house and the town clerk's office. That's a rare photo. Nathaniel Thomas Homestead, that's one of the pictures in your album. The Perry Place, birthplace of Mrs. Thomas Drew. And that is now the location of, the, I think it's the Sunoco station, opposite Town Hall in the town of Hanson. William Bourne Senior House. Uh, Tom Drew's wife was a Bourne. And this is Spring Street in Hanson. The Burger King is over here. Shaw's is back there. McDonald's. It's McDonald's. McDonald's. Very good. I'm glad somebody knows. Uh, this picture was not taken by Thomas Drew. Uh, however, it came down in his family, no doubt because of who he was married to. This is the William Bourne store. That I knew because I could read William Bourne here. It's a daguerreotype. And after a lot of research, I found out that the William Bourne store was where the parking lot is for Hanson Town Hall, right on the pond. And it burned down in 1863. So that picture is one of the oldest images of Hanson that one will ever see. Um, in the Hanson Library, I found a, a diary uh, by a young lady who was telling what was happening in her life. October 1862, she went to a husking in the evening at Gad Soper's. We husked until half past eight and then had a party until about 12. October 19th, father and I picked the four pair of coots and the one pair of loons that he brought home from Brant Rock last night. We had an excellent coot stew for supper. They tell me coot doesn't taste very good. <laughs> and then here's the one I was interested in. November 4th, Sam House and I went to a ball at Bourne's Hall. It was our first appearance in a ballroom to dance. Had a very good time. There was a ballroom on the second floor, and the Bourne store was on the first floor. The Old Bourne Mill. Uh, that, I think, is another one that's in your album, and that's the only way I knew what it was. And I've had a hard time finding out exactly where this is, but I'm assuming it is South Hanson, down on the Halifax line. The Bourne family owned thousands of acres down there, south of uh, the Cranberry Airport, and I think that's where that was located. This is Rocky Run in Hanson in Pembroke. It says Rocky Run on the rock there. Uh, this is actually the town line between Hanson and Pembroke. Pembroke to the right, Hanson to the left, and this cape is still there. The veterinarian, forgotten his name, still lives there, and the pond is, is right here, Dwelly Street. Then we have pictures from Situate, looking south from Jericho Road. I had a hard time identifying this. John Galuzzo looked at it, and he told me right away what it was. And it's looking south from Jericho Road, and you can see all the different cliffs right down. And of course, in 1900, there was virtually nothing on those cliffs. Today, you can't see very far at all. The bridge there, there's a bridge right there that's the one I've forgotten the name of this, the road. Edward Foster. Edward Foster, thank you. I love audience participation. <laughs> uh, this, I think, is one of the greatest pictures that, that he took. I, I love the, the, the way the, the waves come up. This is the wreck of the Helena in Situate, and he liked that, and he went back numerous times and took pictures of the wreck in various stages of decay. And then we have pictures from Norwell, Cornet Stetson Plantation in Norwell. This picture is fairly commonly seen. Uh, it was used in postcards. The Stetson kindred use it. Uh, we have the glass plate negative. I think that's another one that you have in your album. And this is the North River here. And as I say, these were postcards. I have no idea how he managed to get this nice little typed onto the glass plate negative. If somebody knows, please tell me. I'd love to know. Uh, the pavilion was the gathering place. That's Ella, his wife, sitting there, North River. And there's the pavilion today 
that Stetson Kindred gathers every year there. They come from all over the country to uh, celebrate their heritage. North River at the Brick Kilns. This was a fairly common postcard. You're looking from Hanover over to Pembroke. Very interesting hill there. I don't know if that is the Brick Kiln. I've never found out anything about that. Old Quaker Meeting House near Hanover. I'm sure you're all familiar with that, just not with that particular view. This one, I think, is at Ludham's Ford, the Indian Head River. The dam, a dam is still there, but back in 1900, the uh, rubber mill was on both sides of the river. I've never seen a picture with this covered bridge before, and it looks like somebody who's living there had a big family. <laughs> Stetson Pond in Pembroke. Pitch pine tree at Stetson Pond, Pembroke, Mass. A corner bound in 1662 of 204 acres, granted to John Thompson in the Major's Purchase. 47 feet high, 2 feet 10 in diameter, living in 1895, standing in 1904, dead. Photo 1892. And it says M.V. Tilson, so I think Tom didn't take that. Mercer V. Tilson, who was a county surveyor, probably took that picture. Oldham Pond in Pembroke. Uh, in 1900, there was a lot of uh, gunning going on in Oldham Pond. And Hira Bill Bates was one of the gunners. He, he was a neighbor of Tom Drew's on Broadway in Hanover, but he had a gunning stand on Oldham Pond. He had geese, tame geese, that would bring in the wild ones so that he could shoot them. Got a few, very few pictures from Rockland. This is 1912 uh, celebration. And even fewer pictures of Abington. The only pictures of Abington. I have several pictures of a gathering of the Salvation Army at Island Grove Park. Uh, they, they're interesting pictures. You can see off in the corner here the little box camera that they put aside so Tom could get a better picture with his big camera. Which, incidentally, in order to use that big camera, he'd have to have a tripod because you couldn't hold a camera like that steady. And back to South Hanover, he liked to take pictures of people, and lots and lots of pictures of people, most unidentified. So this is the, the conductor at South Hanover Railroad Station with one of the little neighbor kids. And this is Hira Bill Bates uh, with his trained dog, trained to look at the camera when he's told to. He, he should be looking at the, at the treat up there. <laughs> and this cute little girl standing here with her, with her toy. What was her name, do you know? I don't. I, I don't. Wonder if it was my aunt. Could be. I could find out, probably. I may know. Uh, but I don't have it here. And this picture here, this is one of my favorite pictures uh, of this cute little girl with the big hat. Uh, and then this picture I thought was pretty interesting. Um, when, he, when he took his pictures of people, he didn't have a studio. He put a big canvas tarp up on the side of the barn. And of course, you'd have to time it during the day when the light was just right, because you didn't have any lights. But this guy is so cool. He's got, He's got the, the hanky in here. He's wearing overalls, but he's got a tie on. And look at the, look at the pants. <laughs> he needs a good person to hem them. And, and there are many, many pictures like that. Uh, and we end up here. This is the Stetson House in Hanover, which is the home of the Hanover Historical Society. Uh, it's yellow now. This is Hanover Street. The trees are long gone, but the house has been there since 1694, and that's where we have our headquarters, and that's where the Thomas Drew collection of glass negatives resides today. And my book, you can get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or anywhere else. It's $21.99 plus tax. If you buy one from me, it's $20, no tax, and I'll put my autograph on it, which is worth about nothing. <laughs> and that is it.
Excellent. Electronic devices. Jeff, you want to shut? No. <laughs> <laughs> Press again. Okay, I did. I think we got it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, before I ask questions, how about you folks? After seeing the presentation, any any particular questions you may have, or did you ask them all during the presentation? No pictures of Whitman. Um, I don't think there were any in the in his collection from Whitman. There were none. Which, which reminds me of it. There is a picture in the book. And I don't know where the picture is from. It but is you published a, it. it. It is a an urban picture, not a not a country picture, and it's a a three story brick building with stores on the first floor, and up on the top of the building it says Haven Block H A V E N, and it has a date. I think it's 1904, and there are stores on the first floor the William King Grocery, and the sign, I can read that Patterson made the sign, 17 King Street. And when you said Whitman, I thought, well, maybe it could be in the center of Whitman. Yeah. No, it's not Whitman, it's not Rockland. I spent a whole week in the city of Brockton, mm -hmm. and it's not Brockton. I, I, Weymouth. <laughs> I don't know where it is. And it's in the book. If you can, if you know where it is, let me know. But it's not Whitman. No. For some reason, he didn't take any pictures in Whitman. Or it may be that his whole production we don't have. You know, many of them could have been destroyed. I was curious. You, uh, uh, in our collections, I'm sure they're for yours as well. Um, he had quite a few of, of railroad station of, of the Hanover branch railroad station and or I think there were multiple stations and, and locomotives and everything else we have quite a few train enthusiasts around here and of course uh, the Hanover branch rail trail um, through Abington and Rockland has been paved and, and has been developed so um, I don't know that that many people are aware that those particular photos exist so yes um, actually this is my second book mm -hmm. Barbara Barker, Kemp, and I wrote a previous book in 2004, which was Images of America Hanover. Mm -hmm. And that's where the train pictures were. Okay. So I didn't want to use the same it's pictures again, again since I had a large number of them to work with. So, so the answer is buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Not a bad idea. Yes, Marilyn. Um, where did Thomas Drew get his merchandise and how? I do not know. However, the train came right by his store, mm -hmm. right Absolutely. next to the store. In fact, there was a siding uh, for his delivery. So, no doubt, all of his supplies came in by train, but what companies he bought from, I wouldn't know. Uh, I probably, it, some of the photos have products that are labels can be read, but uh, I don't know what they had for suppliers back in that era. And so much came in by train back then. I mean, I think one of the reasons why Abington, Rockland, Whitney became um, the shoemaking capital of, of America basically was because of the train. We could easily get goods to and from Boston and, and shipped out to points beyond once it got to Boston. So that certainly gave a shot in the arm to local industry. Uh, that affected a bunch of industries, but certainly affected something as, as simple and basic as, as bringing in produce and goods for uh, daily living. Uh, I mean, as far as produce, mm -hmm. Hanover was still a, a rural agrarian, agrarian society. So yes. I'm sure yeah. the corn came from just down the street. Uh, in and fact, in, in, in my era, the, there was a cornfield two houses from me. So. There, uh, there were still cattle and dairy farms and things like that, so I'm sure that fresh things would have come right from within the town itself. And Hanover was very much country back then. I mean, yeah, in terms of yeah. industry, there wasn't necessarily a lot going on. Do I recall that correctly? It was mostly farmland? I would say so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have a few Hanover people here who probably know better than I do about that, but um, I think... I mean, back then, there was still... I think you've got a picture in your album of the Goodrich Shoe Factory. 
which was across the intersection. And of course, the, the Phillips Tack factory was still humming in South Hanover as well. And uh, there were other, other industries in town as well. And those were still fed by the railroad, as I recall, oh, in yes. terms of location. Yeah, yeah. So they, they had to be near it. Um, and, and it really contributed to the growth of like everything. So uh, excellent. So he, he did mention his other book, which some things that aren't in this book are in the other. It's, it's worth having the set. Uh, and, and it's certainly interesting stuff in both. So um, any, any other questions? I, I believe you have the books here available for, for sale. I just bought the most recent one. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. What's the name of the other one again? It's Images of America Hanover. So they, would, they would have it at Barnes & Noble, or you can buy them on Amazon. And actually, a question had come in through our website about where one could get the book from someone who wasn't able to be here today. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be responding. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, OK. Oh, no. The negatives, were they in good shape, you know, as far as making, tra you know, transferring yes. those photos uh, to the Did majority you of them, them doctored? The majority of them were in sleeves mm -hmm. uh, and in excellent condition. Some of them were broken, some of them mm -hmm. were... He kept everything so the, there were a number of them that were poor quality. Uh, there might be five plates of the same image and one is good and four are not. Uh, but generally they were, they were in very good shape because they were sleeved and because they stayed with the family through all those years. Keep so safe. they won't, they don't deteriorate over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. They'd be broken before they break down. Yes, as long as they're kept in an environmentally you know, good condition. They, they would break down if they were put in a humid atmosphere. They could get moldy. Um, mm -hmm. So we keep them in a, in a room with a dehumidifier. Because it is emulsion on glass. So yeah, anything yeah. that would break down the bond of the emulsion onto the glass would be detrimental to it long term. And some of them had, had paper that was stuck to the emulsion. Yeah, yeah. And Usually too much humidity. I have not found a way to Safely deal with that. No, no, to get the paper off takes the emulsion off as well. Mm -hmm. And the printing on the negative, you don't know whether that was uh, that was added after, or would that? I have no would, idea. Yeah. But it's so tiny that I, I I really would like somebody to tell me. You had a question. Oh, I'm just wondering if you know how many siblings Thomas Drew had and, and children, and what became of them. Well, I can tell you that. I don't have it memorized, but I wrote it down. <laughs> Let's see. The, the family tree, Cyrus and Evelina, were, were his parents. And Tom had two sisters, Evelina and Mary. Evelina lived 1953. No, that can't be right. That would somebody, be difficult. Somebody <laughs> else gave this to me. Okay. Uh, Cyrus and Evelina. Tom was the son. He married Ella. They had two children, Jane and Thomas. Jane lived 1871 to 1959. Thomas lived short life 1874 to 1893. Jane married Fred Phillips. And it was Jane who donated the two albums to the Dyer Library. Um, as I say, Jane lived 1871 to 1959, so your albums came to you, obviously, before then. Um, Jane married Fred Phillips. They had three children, Elizabeth, Evelina, and Watt II. And Watt II married Sigrid Phillips, and it was Sigrid Phillips from whom I got my glass plate negative. She sold them to me many years ago. And Watt and Sigrid had, a, had at least one son, and it was that son. He just retired, and he donated the remaining things to the Historical Society. Excellent. Is that Watt Phillips, the one who uh, worked in the office of the West Hanover? Yes. Watt and Sigrid lived in the stucco house across from 
the Phillips Mill at West Hanover Square. Yes? Uh, did you develop the transparency yourself, or did a local company develop those? No developing involved. I take the glass plate negative, I put it on my scanner, press the button, and out comes the picture. <laughs> And I can print them on my inkjet printer, or I could take the JPEG or take a TIFF to a store and have it done, you know, developed-wise. But these days, most everything is done, you know, on a laser or Absolutely. an inkjet. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, no chemicals involved. Oh, good to know. We've actually been very fortunate here at the Dyer Library and Historical Society. Abington's tech guy, Wayne Norling Jr., has been on a mission to scan all of our glass plate negatives and other images as well. And that's been very useful. Speaking of volunteering, it's something that he has volunteered to do, one of his passions. Of course, in it for him is he gets to see all these images, and, and he has a fascination with that. So uh, it, it's another example of volunteerism, doing something you like and something we need done. Uh, and, and that's uh, quite a collection. Uh, we have quite a few images between the different collections here. And as Merlin said, they're commingled. So anyway, I'm going to talk a little more, but I'm going to thank you for an excellent program. Well done. And he will be sticking. Sticking around to offer some books for sale and also, I'm sure, answer questions for those who were too shy to ask them on camera and in public. So uh, uh, during refreshments and such, um, I'm sure you can accost him and, and, and buy a book and ask some questions. I just want to take a few minutes now at the end of our program to mention this is the first of six programs that we have pulled together for you. Uh, we meet the first Sunday in October, November, December. We take off uh, for January and February. We start again in March, April, May. The two left of what I call the fall series uh, is the making of the documentary 21 Years of Folded Flag. And that is being addressed by Rudy Childs, Jr. <laughs> Childs is just sitting here, so I'll mention that it's Junior. There are some postcards about us showing it. We're not, not actually going to be seeing the documentary. It's too long. But uh, Rudy was the producer for the film. And it's about uh, Richard Fitz, a former Green Beret who was missing in action, and uh, the story of his son uh, as well. Uh, so that's coming up, I think, appropriately November 5th, approaching uh, Veterans Day then. Uh, we always try to do a church in December. This year we are doing St. Bridget Church. And we normally go to the church, but the first Sunday in December, St. Bridget is doing uh, baptisms. So we're going to do the program here. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they had a, a major anniversary a couple of years ago. The guest speaker will be Robert Kelly, Jr., uh, who worked on the history book and knows it quite well. Coming up in the spring uh, is a program in March as we're all getting ready to start planting and everything. It's local nurseries and greenhouses. Actually, this was a subject su suggested by Doc Taylor, who's in front of me, and we'll be having Wayne Smith come and talk to us. Also, we're, act we're actually talking also to someone in, in Rockland, um, t uh, Tilden, isn't it? Dean. Dean Tilden, yeah. We want to talk with him as well and see if he'll come and join us. Um, the April program, a little late for an anniversary, but uh, Chris Harridan from Hanover is going to be talking to us about the blizzard of 78. And I'd say by the beginning of April, we'll be done with snow, hopefully, for uh, 2019. But we'll be able to reflect on, on the big storm of 78, and I'm sure most of you live through it. I'm really I'm excited about all of them, but the one that um, has come together that was difficult to pull together on May 5th, um, Rick Wolf is coming down to us from Canada and bringing with him the 1901 Lampson motorcycle that was built here in Abington. Uh, the building was where Martini's flooring is now, uh, right near the, the T station. And Rick had reached out to us looking for background information on Lampson, which we were able to help him with. 
but this is one of the things he does. He brings it to shows. This has been featured recently in an antique motorcycle magazine. Uh, it is literally priceless. It's, it's the only one we know remaining. There's another one out there that has a Lampson engine on someone else's uh, frame, and they look like bicycles. That's what they look like. Uh, this, he, he has not made this one run and will not. As he said, they don't run well to begin with, and he has enough of this vintage in his collection that he doesn't feel a need to start this one up. We may, when the time comes, move that program out of the dyer because we'll be inviting historic motorcycle groups and other motorcycle groups to come see this. It's a rare opportunity to see it at all. And he is bringing it down from Canada. He's doing all of this gratis. When I, I was prepared to go out and raise money to get him down here, and he said, no, I'll just come and do it. Uh, which is incredibly generous. So we're very excited about that program. Other things that have gone on, I worked with the uh, United Church of Christ's um, historian um, uh, and went and made a trip to Boston to the Congregational Library and brought back this fine piece of furniture you see up here on the table here. That is one of the chairs belonging to Abington's first minister, Sam Brown. And uh, it was in Abington previously for, I think, either the 250th, I think it was the 250th anniversary of the town. It came and made a visit and went right back to Boston. And the Congregational Library said, you know, we're really not that much about furniture. And would you like it? And there was a little confusion <laughs> as to who they were offering it to, the church or to us. But it ended up coming here. But as I said, I worked with the church historian, Bob Valancourt. And uh, he drove and I carried because uh, we had to deal with Boston traffic and parking and everything else. But we're happy to have it here. There are, there's one more authentic, authenticated Sam Brown chair uh, at United Church of Christ. There's another one attributed to him, which we think belonged to his son or grandson. But uh, it's fun to have these pieces back in town. Not sure where we're putting that yet. It's kind of been hanging around in this room, but we will find a home for it in the building. Um, it was re-leathered in, I think, the 1940s or 50s, but the gentleman who had it done chose a leather that he remembered. It was in his grandfather's hallway, and, and he said, I put the same red leather, red, believe it or not, leather on that I remembered from his hallway. So um, that's, that's why that piece is here. We're constantly dealing with history things that come up. A lot of them land in my lap because they can find my email address really easily. So we're constantly answering questions. There's another one that I want to tell you the story about and I'll just tease you with it because I'm not really authorized to do it yet. There is a piece of silver floating around that the story was that Paul Revere made it and gave it to um, Thomas Pulling, who was a dear friend of his who helped him hang lights at at North Ch Old North Church, and it was spirited away from Boston um, when the pullings escaped and eventually found its way to Abington. Um, the piece exists. It's been locked up in a vault for three generations. I saw it last month and helped with some research on it, and it was not made by Paul Revere. It was made by his father, <laughs> to which you would think would make it Super, super valuable. The auction houses said, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Seriously, and, and anyway, but what a piece of history. And, and I have held it in my hands. And it's still in private ownership. It may remain that way. But I want to tell more of the story, and I have photographs. So we will, at some point in a future time, address that. Um, this stuff just comes out of the woodwork at us. And, and we love to, to get it and know what to do with it and, and help people understand what they have. <laughs> So with that, um, I do want to point out um, Abington Celebrates is putting on Oktoberfest celebration next weekend. There are some brochures here on the table if you'd like. I also want to point out that in the Sam Dyer room just across the hall, we have set up a table, a membership and volunteer table. It's time if you have an annual membership to renew it. Um, you can do that then, you can do it through mail. We will be mailing out this week our annual pamphlet which lists all of the programs and other information about the society and our writing award and everything else. Look for that in your mail. 
Um, what else? I'm forgetting. So, oh, volunteer sheets. Uh, Merlin talked about volunteering in general. Yes, absolutely. But we have some immediate needs here, and one of them is refreshments. I mean, it's, five, it's six times a year, so it's five more times. Uh, if you'd like to sign up to help with that, you can even write specifics. If there's, you want to bring cheese and crackers every time, let us know. But um, we, we need volunteers for that. We also need volunteers for our programming committee. In the past, the program committee has been to come up with the programs we're putting on. And it's, a, it's been a great group. Everyone's had some great ideas. We're going to expand their scope of work to say not only are you helping us come up with the, the programs, you're gonna help us set up for them too. So, uh, but if, if you don't have the physical wherewithal to be moving chairs and tables, that's fine. Just volunteer for it anyway, and we'll only ask you to do what you're capable of doing. But, but we're looking for some physical labor this time as well. So there are sign-up sheets, again, for the table for that, and we appreciate your participation. Uh, I'm going to turn you loose now to the back room where there are refreshments set up and hope that you enjoy those, enjoy the uh, social time. And, and one thing I try to always do is, uh, will the members here, members of the society, please raise their hand. And if you see someone around you who is not a member, please make sure that they feel welcome and say hi to them. And anyway, uh, we'll see you in about a month. Go have some food. Thank you all very much, and thank you, cable audience at home. Thank you. Watch cable, cable. Have you spoken? <laughs>